Okay. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I'm your co-host, Chris Seventy, uh, and today I have a very special guest who this was somebody I've been trying to get on, or it's really my fault, honestly, um, you know, for the first 100 episodes because this is my go-to guy. Um, here is the little angel on my shoulder who keeps me uh, in check, and that is Brian Gallagher from Council Baradell, who is a rock star attorney in Maryland. Um, Brian, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm broadcasting live from my uh, daughter's playroom basement. So uh, please don't think that uh, my office is decorated <laughs> with uh, framed be brave and be happy. Uh, <laughs> So, well, I am broadcasting from my dining room table. I got the two windows, so it looks like I'm in heaven yeah. or something, you know, shining a light through me. I got my son's Xbox headset on because he's using uh, mine for his school stuff. Um, so I just figured it's easier to block out all the different sounds using what I've got. Um, so yeah, we are all quarantined at home during this time frame. So, but today I wanted to talk about a subject that's come up a lot lately. And that is uh, joint venture agreements. And Brian, for those who don't know, pretty much touches and drafts every agreement that I have um, or that I need reviewed. And I, you know, typically on first occasions of dealing with somebody, I always have an attorney review it and I send it over to Brian who um, takes a look at that. And like I said, make sure he's protecting, um, you know, the, the interests of his clients. So kind of with that, Brian, do you want to do a quick introduction uh, on yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, I'll say a couple things here. Uh, first, uh, one is you are far too kind uh, with your introduction. <laughs> um, second, and because I am a lawyer, I'm going to go ahead and preface everything I say with the disclaimer that uh, while I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. <laughs> you be the audience. So um, everything Chris and I discuss here um, is hypothetical and in the abstract. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, uh, I'm with uh, the Annapolis-based law firm of Council Baradell, Cosmer and Nolan. I've been there about a decade now. Um, I'm licensed in Maryland, D.C. and Virginia, and the majority of my practice uh, is dedicated to representing uh, the note investing community. Um, and uh, I say it like that because the note investing community, um, in my observation and experience, is far different than uh, the mortgage industry. Um, and what I mean by that is um, when you work for the big banks and you're doing working with distressed assets with the big banks, um, it's more of a mill situation. Um, uh, it's a lot of paint by numbers. Um, I take pride in, in, and I'm happy working with the note investing industry um, because of the creative way in which they approach their assets, um, the creative way in which they're, they attempt to reach an exit strategy uh, or a resolution with the borrower. So that's something I take pride in is working with uh, the investors uh, and the borrowers and obtaining a good result for everybody when possible because it's not always possible as Chris well knows. <laughs> yes. It seems like anytime I get a challenging case, um, you know, I send it your way. Uh, one of the things I just want to kind of mention about that uh, before we roll into it is you mentioned, you know, the note investing community and from an attorney's perspective, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is finding attorneys who specialize with note investors because a lot of people will find real estate attorneys, which I view as far different than note investor. Um, attorneys. Would you agree with that? I absolutely would. Um, you know, a real estate attorney, it, it can be a number of different things. Um, you know, it can be transactional, meaning getting deals done, you know, buying and selling. Um, it can be, you know, litigation, um, you know, disputes over property lines, ownership, um, you know, evictions, things like that. And I, I do a lot of that. Um, but that's not to say that every attorney that does, you know, purchase and sale transactions um, is also versed enough in doing a loan modification or a workout or doing a foreclosure. Um, so you have to find the right, the right fit for you. Um, and that's equally the same with, you know, a lot of foreclosure firms 
you know, they won't do the workout. They won't, um, you know, do the loan modification. You know, you give them the file and, and they will run that to the ground on a foreclosure. Um, and uh, that's kind of that. So, you know, there are distinctions. I'm sure it's hard for you guys in the note investing community um, to find attorneys in all the various jurisdictions um, that you guys have assets in to, to suit your needs. Yeah, that, that has been a challenge of mine. And over the time, what I've kind of done is as I evolve, um, you know, I find attorneys now that are more than just, um, you know, one state attorneys, you know, I'll, use, I'll try and find attorneys that do four or five states or, you know, like yourself who does three states. Um, and that way, it's, I find it a little more simplistic in regards to, you know, if I'm doing deals in 25 states, I have 25 different attorneys, maybe I'm down to 10 to 12. Um, yeah. So from that perspective, so, well, uh, and again, I want to just, you know, preface that I say positive things about you, not to, um, because you do keep me, you know, protected, um, you know, for people that don't know, basically, I mean, you've drafted, let's see, my operating agreement, um, you know, my JV agreements, my loan sale agreements. I mean, every con, you know, it's not only just for a note investor, it's, you know, for a note investing business, which I think is very different that people need to understand as well is that there's that component to it that you assist with. Um, but today, again, I wanted to roll into because a lot of people um, have been talking about, you know, joint venture agreements and, you know, what should be in them. Because, I mean, I've seen people who have them be one page agreements and I've seen people have, you know, a 30 page agreement. And I think, you know, that's, you know, kind of both ends of the scale. I think mine is roughly 10 pages um, long, which, uh, I, you know, it's really not the length of it, but it's the content, of course, that goes involved and um you know you, i think you know for today we just wanted to kind of have some open discussion in regards to um what should be included in some of these agreements so i'll let you just kind of start um from the top on some of these things so uh a joint venture agreement um there's a couple things to really understand with them um a joint venture agreement it, it, it uh, the best way to think about it is it is a mini operating agreement. Good, um, good context. Meaning, meaning um, in an operating agreement, an operating agreement is used to define how the members of an LLC are gonna interact with each other and what their duties and obligations are with respect to that LLC. The same is true for a joint venture agreement. So to that effect, a good joint venture agreement, in addition to, um, the, the basic things of, okay, this is how much each is contributing. This is what we're gonna you know, use the joint venture to accomplish. It also needs to address the buy-sell situations. When I say buy-sell situations, what I mean is, how do you get in and out of the joint venture agreement? Now, in the perfect world, you get into it by both parties, you know, contributing what they're going to contribute to acquire the asset, to manage the asset, and then dispose of the asset, and then everything's done, and the and the funds are distributed, and now the joint venture is over. But things don't always work that way, <laughs> especially in the note investing world. There uh, are a myriad of things that can happen to throw a wrench in the plan, and when those things happen. Uh, the parties need to understand what their rights and obligations are in terms of maybe somebody wants to get out of the joint venture. Are they allowed to get out of it? And if they are allowed to get out of it, how does that go about happening? What if neither party wants to get out of it, but they are stuck at an impasse and they can't agree on a major decision uh, to be made? What happens then? So those are things that need to be thought about and need to be addressed um, when drafting a joint venture. Yeah. And one of the things I'll use a caveat to um, is, you know, whoever's drafting this, it shouldn't be you, you know, in the sense of, you know, people watching, if you're not an attorney, you absolutely should have an attorney draft this. And, you know, there's gonna be, you know, in these, a lot of the basic things like, you know, 
who are the parties? You know, what entity are, is the, you know, the sponsor is the person who's bringing the deal and the investor is the one in the note space typically who's bringing the cash to the table. In most note investing JV deals, the investor brings 100% of the capital. The sponsor is the one who's kind of managing the asset. And, um, you know, some of the basic stuff, like you mentioned, you know, what are the parties, you know, what is the asset that's going to be included? You mentioned the roles and responsibilities. I think that is, you know, very key um, because there's also the, you know, making sure that it's not considered, you know, a sale of a security where, you know, you're guaranteeing a return. So there needs to be some involvement from, you know, both parties as part of this deal. Um, and you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a, you know, when deals go smoothly, the JV, you know, agreement is kind of like, you know, okay, but it's only when things go upside down um, is when you need to have all these little, um, you know, I call them caveats, but, you know, contingencies in the agreement, um, you know, such as, you know, if somebody wants to get out, is there a penalty? You know, one of the things that I see people struggle with, honestly, Brian, is, how is the pay structure done? Like, you know, people will be like, okay, you know, somebody contributed $20,000, the borrower pays a thousand bucks, you know, how does that get dispersed? You know, <laughs> simple things like that I've seen, um, you know, go awry in that sense. Um, and, you know, one of the other things I think that's important is, you know, like you mentioned, outlining the roles or the management focus. There's, I view that, you know, that is, two components. There's managing the access itself, but managing, like you said, this mini operating agreement or the deal itself for communicating um, in, yep, in, in ways of like, what is the reporting process? You know, is, are you reporting to this person daily, weekly, monthly, yearly? Um, you know, some of those things uh, as well. Would you agree? Right. So, yeah. So one of, you kind of hit on this, the overarching thing to understand when you're doing a, a JV deal is you have to give consideration to whether this is an investment. Um, as you know, the SEC and whether something is an, is an investment in the JV world, it's kind of like the boogeyman. We know it's there. You know, you think it's there. You're pretty sure it's there, but you don't really know what it is. Um, now, the SEC or the courts have defined uh, what an investment is. Um, the standard for determining whether something is an investment is whether you intend to make money solely off of the efforts of others. So you are going to give somebody a thousand dollars, you're not going to do anything. And then in a year's time, you expect to get back $1,500. That is an investment. Um, one of the problems that I see with a lot of JV deals, and, and this is a problem and it is an investment, is when you're going to take money from somebody and then in the deal, you tell them you're a silent partner. I'm going to make all the decisions. That is, that's an investment. That's so, a big no, no. Yeah. So my biggest concern from a legal standpoint, um, because there's legal considerations and business considerations when you're drafting a JV agreement, my biggest concern when drafting a JV deal is to do everything that I can to ensure that when somebody reads this, they don't believe that this is an investment. So what that means is that when I draft this, I try to make crystal clear one by saying this is not an investment. Um, two, by giving the person that you're JVing with a real and actual duty, obligation, and opportunity to participate meaningfully in the management of the asset. Mm -hmm. So that means that they are not expecting to make money solely off the effort of others. And the analogy that I use is if you're going to invest, if you're going to give money to Vanguard or T. Rowe Price, you can't call up uh, the, the chief investment strategy officer and say, hey, I think solar is about to get hot. Let's move some money that way. You can, but he's going to laugh at you. <laughs> yeah, you can, but he's going to laugh at you and he doesn't have to do anything. Yeah. 
um, when you're in a JV deal, um, your JV partner should have the opportunity to say, hey, um, you know, I understand this person is in default. They haven't paid for a little while. Um, let's talk about what a modification would look like and what we would accept as a modification or what we wouldn't accept. And let's talk about what a foreclosure would look about look like. Mm -hmm. If it's going to foreclosure, um, that JV uh, partner has to have the real and actual opportunity to discuss with you, okay, what's going to be our starting bid? What, what's going to be the bottom line that we're going to allow this to sell for? Um, those are different than, you know, hero price that decides what, you know, when they're going to get out of it. <laughs> you know, you can't call them and say, hey, when the price of Google hits 200, we need to buy or sell. Yeah. Um, so just some things to consider. That's, you know, my biggest uh, heartache and my biggest concern when I'm drafting these agreements is to stress that this can't be an investment. Mm -hmm. So in regards to that, let me ask this question to you because this gets posed to a lot of people. The agreement states that, you know, the investor has, you know, this, you know, this, I'll call it this duty that they're, you know, part of the team. If they choose to basically, you know, stay silent. And if you're reaching out to them saying, okay, you know, look, you know, the bar hasn't paid in 90 days. I'm going to send a demand letter. What do you think? Um, and then you pick up the phone and call them. If they're non-responsive to you, I mean, you've given them the opportunity, but they're not using it. You know, is that okay in that sense? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, the onus or the liability is on you. Yeah. The liability is not on them. The liability mm -hmm. for this being an actual investment is mm -hmm. on you. So mm -hmm. as long as you are doing things um, that, that prove that your intent was not in taking an investment, that, is, mm -hmm. it, that it is actually in having a partner to, to assist mm -hmm. in the management uh, of this deal, then mm -hmm. I, I, think it's, I think you're mm -hmm. suiting, you know, yeah. you're doing the right thing. Yeah. And it's basically from my understanding, it's really kind of decision making process. If you have a performing note, um, you know, you have a duty to report to them the information and so forth, but there's really no decisions to be made. So in that instance, um, you know, I, I view it as, you know, you keep them informed. Um, you know, and things just go on their merry way. And then while suddenly when it turns sideways on you, that's when it's like, okay, now you, you, you bring them involved. I mean, you always want to keep communicating with them, but in those times when decisions are being made, that's really the biggest effort where you, you should be um, reaching out to them uh, to kind of bring them in the loop. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And now, that's, um, that's, you know, something that I always explicitly like to see in operating agreements is that, you know, if something's going to be reclassified from performing to non-performing, there needs to be a discussion and a, a joint decision made. Yep. Now, what happens if, um, you know, you've got a borrower, the 93-year-old, you know, little old lady who misses, you know, goes 90 days behind and you tell your joint venture partner, hey, you know, you know, little Mrs. Smith is behind. Um, you know, we're going to basically defer and the person comes back and says, hell no, I want you to foreclose on this, you know, on them, screw them and so forth. And basically you're like, okay, you know, for, you know, you're like, Hey, that's not in our best beneficial interest to foreclose because the house might be upside down and it wouldn't be as profitable. And the person's like, I don't care. I just want to foreclose on this person. Um, you know, how, what would happen in something like that? <laughs> Sure. So there should be, there should be language in there um, that, that deals with when you are at an impasse. Mm -hmm. um, and typically that is what invokes a buy sell provision. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you hear a lot about buy sell. What does that mean? Well, it means, it typically means that when you reach a point with a partner where you just can't move forward because you're at an impasse or a deadlock, you know, mm -hmm. are you going to sell your interest to them or that, or are you going to buy them out? You know, that whole process. Um, mm -hmm. 
and that in and of itself and how that is written it's more of a business decision than mm -hmm. it is um a legal decision um so in order to understand how you want that to work in your joint venture agreement um it's a business decision mm -hmm. you know are you in a position that if you get to that point and there is an impasse um do you want to just say all right you know we're at an impasse um we're refusing to move forward uh we're now just gonna sell this entire asset to somebody else and, and we have to sell it to the highest and best bidder within 30 days and we'll distribute the, the proceeds of that sale in such and such manner. Um, does that work best for your business model or does it work better for your business model that you now have an opportunity to buy that person out and you coordinate um, how you guys are gonna reach that price of, of the buy sell? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... One question that comes up a lot is in typical contracts and in, including these agreements, you know, if there is a dispute, it is settled in, you know, it's based on the laws of a certain state. And, you know, the question comes up, should it be, you know, the state that, you know, the sponsor is in, the state the investor is in, the state the asset is in, you know, the state that your attorney is in, because all four of those could be different. What, what right. is you know, what, what would you, you know, respond to that? You know, what would you recommend to somebody? Sure. So generally speaking, what the law generally is, <laughs> you can't, you know, stress my hedging on this. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, the way the courts are going to interpret this is this is a business deal. This is not a mm -hmm. consumer transaction. So this is a business deal. The courts are going to interpret you everybody as a well-heeled businessman um mm -hmm. or bus business person excuse me yeah. um uh that is capable of making their own business decisions when entering into a contract so what i mean by all that is you can pick it to be whatever you want it to be okay so the courts are gonna let's say that the property is in california um and the two joint you know, the joint ventures and are you are in Florida and your partners in uh, Maine. Mm -hmm. um, what are you going to do? Well, maybe everybody just decides that if there's a dispute, it's going to be settled um, jurisdictionally uh, in accordance with District of Columbia law. Mm -hmm. That you're going to use District of Columbia courts, um, mm -hmm. you're going to use DC law, and that's where it's going to be settled. Or you're going to say, you know, Typic, you know, you're going to say, no, you can't go to court. This is only subject to binding arbitration. Um, mm -hmm. And that arbitration is going to take place in the jurisdiction of your choosing um, mm -hmm. in accordance with the laws of that jurisdiction, in accordance mm -hmm. with the, the the rules promulgated by the American Association of Arbitration. Yeah. I mean, for me, and I can say this because I'm not the attorney, you know, I have it written mine for the state where my rock star attorney is located because he's the one that wrote the agreement. So then I'm going to put him to the task of defending it. <laughs> so yeah, you, you uh, wrote it, you, you defend it. <laughs> exactly. Um, speaking, um, you know, about writing these, um, you know, when somebody's entering into, um, and again, if I'm an investor and I'm looking to, you know, the sponsor sends me this, you know, one of the, you know, one of the first questions I typically ask is, you know, who drafted this, um, agreement? And sometimes people, you know, people sometimes get like hesitant for, you know, they're like, Oh, none of your business type thing. And I'm just curious. And, you know, I view it as, you know, Hey, look, I just, you know, want to know for, from your professional opinion, you know, when you review these, do you like to know where they come from? A hundred percent. Um, uh, and the reason I like to know is it, there's a couple of different reasons. One, first and foremost, sometimes, um, you just want to know where it's coming from. You know, did a person pull this off of the internet? Um, did they have an attorney write it? Um, because when you're reading it, sometimes it makes it makes more sense to you if you understand an attorney wrote this versus they pulled it off the internet um, and 
you know, it may or may not be uh, relevant to what we're actually trying to accomplish here. Um, you know, if an attorney wrote it, sometimes you give a little bit more deference to things. Um, and what I mean by that is I don't mean that you just take their word for it, nor do I mean you review it even harder because you think that an attorney is trying to be slick and slide something by you. Um, you just need to understand where it came from. Um, and it helps you review it a little bit better. Now, the other thing too, is this happens a lot. I get clients who will call me up and say, Hey, can, uh, you know, I need you to review a contract. You know, what's the flat, you know, what's it going to, what's it going to, uh, cost me, you know, can you do it for a flat fee of $250, $500? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if, an, if a good attorney wrote it on the other side, yeah, sure. I, I can, it's probably easy to review it for that much, mm -hmm. but if they give you something that, you know, a non-attorney drafted that has never done this before, it would cost mm -hmm. you less money just to have your attorney redraft the entire thing from starting because they probably already have a template that they've used in the past. They can mm -hmm. edit for your purposes. Yeah. We, we've seen that on, on loan sale agreements that, you know, you and I have done where the loan sale agreement comes through and, you know, it was clearly to find that it wasn't from an attorney and basically uh, you know i remember going back to them and just saying hey here's one for my attorney can you just take a look at it and versus using the one that you had and you know they agreed <laughs> um, but yeah you know that's that's a good point there um i mean i mean the thing to keep in mind regarding most of these things is that generally speaking people are committed to getting a deal done and they want to find the path of least resistance so Asking them these questions um, and, and letting them know, listen, I'm committed to trying to work this deal through. I just, you know, we're trying to find the path of least resistance here. Mm -hmm. So just help me out. Let me know a little bit of understanding of where this agreement came from. Yeah. And for me personally, I wouldn't really be too trustworthy or feel confident, um, you know, sending somebody money who won't even tell me where stuff comes from. <laughs> You know, um, you know, and again, from my perspective, uh, you know, I, I'm looking more for transparency from somebody, um, you know, because, you know, and I'll ask you this question, you know, how many, you know, I'd say, you know, note deals go, can go bad. And when they go bad, you know, people can potentially lose money on them. Um, that's part of the risk of the business. Um, but, you know, how many, I'd say lawsuits you know, or how many, have you ever defended um, anybody because, um, you know, there was a JV deal, a note deal where, you know, person just lost money, but just, you know, because of that versus the person not doing something that's dictated in the agreement that they should have done um, and basically caused, you know, you know, heartache or they were just completely incompetent and um, wasn't doing anything. Just curious if, so I actually, I haven't seen any JV agreements or loan sale agreements. I haven't seen any lawsuits um, arising solely out of those um, yet. Um, and you've been doing this how long? A decade. Yeah. Um, you know, the only times I've seen JV agreements or loan sale agreements litigated is when there is, is when it's uh, tangential to another issue that's been raised. For instance, a borrower is suing the current note holder uh, for an alleged RESPA violation. And there's, uh, you know, because the loan has been assigned a couple of times, now people are arguing over, you know, what was represented and warranted in the loan sale from the predecessor in interest. You had to bring that up, didn't you? I didn't name any names. I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened to me. Um, but actually, you uh, were assisting me, but you didn't actually uh, weren't representing me on that one. Um, but so, yeah, that brings up a good point. I mean, Oh, 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 oh. No, nope. it's okay. Nope, go ahead. <laughs> Hold on, let me just pause it. Okay, we're back. We had to pause for a minute. Um, you know, and that's the thing that, you know, I think a lot of people should, you know, understand, you know, we've all had deals go bad. Um, 
and so, and so forth. So, you know, for my recommendation is, you know, follow what's in the agreement. And then, you know, at the end of the day, someone can sue you for anything, but, you know, I think it was Warren Buffett or somebody said, you know, somebody can sue you for any, you know, sue you for anything, but, you know, you, you can always get sued, but you shouldn't be losing, you know, in that sense yeah. or something along those lines. Is, yeah. You, you know, do and, what you should to not lose. Is, I, I've, I've been involved in countless disputes regarding loan sales. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everywhere from, you know, huge funds, um, that I've represented that are buying thousands and thousands of loans um, mm -hmm. at, at the same time, all the way down to a person buying a single loan from a seller. Um, I've been involved in countless disputes over um, what you sold me, um, you know, you need to take this back or, or whatever the case might be. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in virtually every single one of those situations, uh, they were able to reach a resolution. Mm -hmm. And, and, yeah. and the, that's because, generally speaking, in this note industry, people try not to get bogged down on things. They view it from a business decision. How much is mm -hmm. it going to cost me to fight this? Do mm -hmm. I want the press that comes along with mm -hmm. fighting this? Because your industry mm -hmm. is small. Yeah. I, I, I think if you get the reputation of somebody who is a pain to buy notes from or to sell notes to people mm -hmm. are just going to stop selling or buying from you. No, that's a hundred percent. I can't agree more with that, that this is really such a small little niche industry and your reputation is huge. And um, from that it's, you know, you, you just want to make sure that, you know, you do the right thing. And, you know, it's the kind of the way I look at it. That's still, you know, if there's a dispute, you know, you need to, you know, sometimes flex, you know, your muscle a little bit to sure. make sure you're defending yourself. But at the end of the day, um, you got to be careful that, again, like you mentioned, it's going to cost me $10,000 to fight this thing. And, you know, we're fighting over three grand, you know. It's just like dealing with a borrower, you know, yeah. you give them the cash for keys for three grand, even though you, sh you hate giving them any money, um, but it's going to save you in the long run. So yeah, good points. Um, what are, you know, some of the other things that, um, you know, any lessons learned from JV agreements or things that you've seen that kind of, you know, has caused you to like shake your head maybe that you've seen from people or um, any crazy stories with JVs, just out of curiosity, if there's been, um, you know, some, you know, any lessons learned. And like I said, because it's somewhat such a and small biz industry, I'm not sure, you know, it's, um, you know, if there is a lot, you know, of stories out there. Um, yeah. Well, this is, this is what I'll say. Um, and I kind of, I don't want to use it examples because mm -hmm. of, uh, it is a small industry and I don't mm -hmm. want people to get hip mm -hmm. to what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is what I'll say doing a JV deal. It's like dating. Um, yep. and, that, and that trust your gut. If, if you're trying to work out a JV deal with somebody and you get the impression that, wow, this person is going to be a giant pain in the butt to deal with, or this person is a little bit too slick for their own good, you know, do I want, you know, to continue dating this person and to get in a relationship with them? You know, this, trust your gut. If, if this, you get, you know, I do it with clients all the time. There's plenty of people that, you know, that, that call me that, you know, want results that are just outside the realm of possibility. Um, I don't want that person as a client. Um, you know, so don't be so desperate for a JV partner, um, or for a client, you know, from, from my standpoint that you're willing to take anybody in every day, everybody. That, that is the best analogy. And, you know, here is a perfect example um so i've pretty much gotten out of you know jv agreements and 
run everything now, you know, within funds. Um, and that's kind of, you know, I think the progression of, you know, node investors that they try and get is, okay, let me get out of these JV deals because of, you know, some of the inherent risks um, that, you know, somebody just files a complaint with the SEC because they think you did something wrong. And then you have to defend it with a, a fund. I think it's more, you know, you've got the paperwork and everything kind of already submitted in that sense. But, you know, I had a conversation the other day with somebody who was interested in, you know, credit investor interested in some funds down the line and stuff and um you know conversation went on a little longer than anticipated and i told them i said hey i've got a hard stop at this time so you know we do the hard stop and i said hey you know basically he's like okay can you send me some information and so forth and follow up phone call and i was you know like yes i'll send you information i'll follow up phone call but it's going to be a few days the next morning the guy calls me early in the morning um and, you know, I, I didn't answer it, um, you know, cause I was, you know, having breakfast, that's, you know, how early it is. And I'm an early morning person. And they also sent me a text, like, are you going to send me this information? So, oh, no, are you going to send me this information or not? So, uh, you know, literally the next day and, you know, that's the thing where I look at it and be like, I'm done. You know, it's basically, I'm already like, you know what, I can already tell this person is going to be such a royal pain in the ass. And, you know, for people listening out there just getting started, you know, the first time, few times you do a JV deal, which I highly recommend you buy other notes and know their process before raising money, um, you know, from that standpoint, uh, you know, you're so excited when you're like, oh, I got a JV, you know, I got somebody to fund a deal and so forth. You know, it's like, you're just ecstatic. And like, it's almost like, um, you know, you, you'll take, you know, you'll take anybody is kind of, I think what happens to a lot of people. And then like, I look back now and, you know, I've had more than 50 different people probably. And there's a handful who I'm like, oh my God, thank God I got rid of that person. Um, you know, from that perspective. So, um, one question I wanted to ask you kind of just popped in my head um, is, you know, with these JV deals, you know, sometimes there are people who have never kind of done a note deal and they're doing JV deals and stuff. Would somebody like that have any liability for, um, you know, basically, you know, not being experienced, I guess, or, you know, <laughs> It, those <laughs> situations make me so nervous. Um, <laughs> I, I can't, I can't agree more with what you said, Chris, of you got to know what you're doing before you go out there and, and try to jump in some JV deals. Yeah. I mean, um, I have language in here that basically states, Hey, look, people are going to hold me harmless unless I'm like, you know, willfully negligent or reckless or fraudulent. I mean, could somebody argue, I mean, it, could somebody argue that's reckless right then and there by doing this? You know, I'm just no, curious. Yeah. <laughs> not, <clears throat> no, not if your JV agreement is written mm -hmm. the right way. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if it's written the right way, it is a joint venture where you are mm -hmm. jointly doing something. Mm -hmm. um, it's different if you are running a fund and you are soliciting money from people um, based off of representations that you know what you're doing when in fact you don't know what you're doing. Um, but the reality of the situation is if you don't know what you're doing and you're doing joint ventures, it, it, it's just more likely to lead to problems. What exactly are those problems going to be? They could be a myriad of different things. But um, if, if you know what you're doing and you have experience and you can answer all the questions um, that arise, you're just in a better position to succeed and, and experience less problems with your joint venture. Yeah, I mean, we could have a whole nother subject on vetting people that, you know, you should be doing business with. I mean, that's a whole nother, we'd be, you know, could be here for another hour um, yeah. on that one <laughs> and so forth. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and actually, I'm just kind of scrolling through the JV agreement right now um, that we have and so forth. And just, uh, you know, anything that, you know, pops up and so forth. And some of this, you know, again, generic things in there. One thing that comes up a lot too is, um, you know, people ask this question, okay, how am I protected? You know, because nothing's getting recorded, you know, it's basically a contract, um, you know, and people think, um, you know, 
and what I tell them is it's just like any other contract you sign. Like if you have signed somebody to drywire your house, there's nothing recorded there. You have a contract with them to fulfill an obligation. And if they don't fill it, then, you know, you have to go down that path. But people sometimes think, oh, because like, you know, that note or, you know, is get the assign the, the mortgage is getting assigned to you. Um, you know, how am I protected and stuff? And people ask about putting assignment, their names on assignments. For me, I tell people, you know, if you want to, fine. But, you know, at the end of the day, back to that question, comment you made, if a borrower starts saying there's RESPA violations being claimed, they're suing everybody who's on that assignment chain, and it would include you as well. Um, So, you know, that's more of a business decision. But I'm just curious, because that question gets asked a lot. um, You know, how how do you respond to that? If someone says, you know, how are they protected? Is it any different than if you were a minority owner in, you know, a Wendy's franchise? You know, is anything recorded for that? No, it's a contract. Yeah. So, So it's, you know, it's just the nature of things. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, you want to make sure the person that you're entering this contract in is somebody who you want to do business with. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so that's one, um, you know, another component to this, um, like you mentioned, is clearly spelling out who gets paid, how much they get paid, and when, because um, that's something that um, I see gets disputed a lot in regards to, um, you know, deals, especially, you know, and especially the ones that go hairy. And when I say hairy, it's the ones that, okay, the the investor put up 20 grand, the sponsor ended up putting 4,000 bucks into the deal. And at the end of the day, you know, you lose money, you sell it for 20 grand. How is that dispersed? Does the investor get their 20 grand, the sponsor lose four? Is it, you know, how, how, you know, that's something you definitely want to clarify. Yeah. And that's why you have to be an experienced note investor to get into JV deals because only if you're an experienced note investor, do you understand how notes cash flow? And do you understand how realistically you can expect proceeds to come in and what is gonna have to be paid out of those proceeds before the actual owner of the note sees a dollar? Because if you've never done it before or if you don't really understand how the cash flow of a note works, how are you going to successfully write a uh, a JV agreement, cash flow waterfall that accomplishes your business goals? Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I tell people a lot is, you know, that's I can give you some examples of how some waterfall distributions work in JV agreements that I've done or operating agreements that I've done for LLCs, but that's a business decision. You know, mm-hmm. those things are they're not a legal decision. They're a business decision. Um, and you have to make sure that how that happens fits into your business plan. Yeah. And, and that's where I tell people be very cautious when you get a JV agreement from somebody else, you know, like I've you know de- dealt with people who worked with me and they've turned around and taken my agreement and used it for, you know, when they got experience to JV with people and, you know, mine, I think, and you know, I'll mention this, mine is very unique. And I know you at first thought like, are you sure that you would want to do this in regards to that payment structure, which is, you know, all the money that comes in up front on mine goes right back out the door. Um, I don't take any of my profit split early on. Um, you know, if somebody's paying 400 bucks a month and that's interest, you know, if it's a 50, 50 split, what people do is, okay, you get 200, I get 200. Um, and they start, you know, collecting it at that point in time, the way my deals, you know, it right now um, are written is that that 400 comes in, you know, basically of that interest, I'm dishing that back out to the JV. Now I can do that because I work full time and I don't need this, you know, income to, you know, put food on the table. But on the flip side, if this is your full time gig and all of a sudden you took my JV agreement and started using it all of a sudden and didn't read it, um, all of a sudden you're looking at it and the person's like, Oh, where's my money? It's like half. And it's like, Oh no, the agreement doesn't say that. So there's, you know, each agreement is specifically catered to the investor. So that's why you just can't take one. Even if it's written by an attorney, you still just don't want to take it off the shelf. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of times where I've made a suggestion to uh, to a potential client of of a you know they say, well, I, I don't know, can you can you suggest a waterfall to me? And I'll say, okay, well, here's one that I've used for other people in the past, and they'll look at it and they'll be like almost offended by it. <laughs> like, listen, you know, I'm telling you, this is a business decision. Yeah. You know, what is your business model? What is your business plan? Yours obviously isn't what this last person's was. So, yeah. yeah, there's so many nuances to these agreements that you, you, you're right. It's there's so many business decisions. It's no different than like you, you know, you're writing documents for a fund. Um, you know, it's just because you know you can't just take you know you've written my PPM documents and somebody just can't take that and copy and paste it to somebody else because how I structure everything versus how somebody else structures it is completely different. Um, yeah. And how yeah. I mean, with, with a lot of these, with JV agreements, fund agreements, operating agreements, mm -hmm. there's a lot of template language yeah. um, that is just, it's standard. It's going to be there, you know, no matter what, but there's, the, the places that are not template language are generally the most important places that need the most thought and the most, you know, uh, mm -hmm. take the most um, mm -hmm. time for a business to decide how they want to operate. So we're, you know, coming up on time. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention, uh, because I don't know anybody else that does this. Um, and you recommended it to me and, you know, I do it and I actually got to get a few of them done, but when an asset is liquidated, I don't know anybody else that has basically, you know, a cancellation of, okay, our deal is done type thing, a termination agreement for the JV. Um, you know, so, and that's one thing that I think is important. Um, because, you know, you paid somebody off who knows two years later, they could come back and say, Hey, you still owe me 3000 bucks. Um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, you know, do you, you know, do you see a lot of people doing that? Um, no, no. no, um, no, I, I, I don't see a lot of people doing that. Um, but it's always, it's a good thing to consider, especially if, um, your JV agreement is a very finite. Thing. You know, regardless of whether you uh, have an official document or not, it's always a good business decision just to have in writing, you know, between two parties of, hey, we're good, we're good, we're done, we're done. Okay, yeah. see you later. Yeah. So, because I've, you know, I'll be honest, I've dealt with um, some partners who they're a little scatterbrained um, and they've, you know, and I've actually had them sign the document that I had you draft and they came back four months later, it's like, Oh yeah, where's the final, you know, $4,000 on this. And I'm like, I sent that to you three months ago and I had you sign this thing saying you're paid in full. Oh really? Can you resend that to me? Yep. Um, but you know, it's, uh, you know, just something that if you ever have to pull it out and probably the one time I'll ever have to do it, but at least I had it at that point in time and didn't have to spend, you know, an hour and a half trying to dig through emails to find it. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, one thing I just want to kind of wrap up with Brian, um, is, uh, you know, we talk about JVs. Um, and again, this is something you draft, um, pretty much any type of documents, uh, overall between JV agreements, PPMs, um, you know, basically loan sale agreements, uh, pretty much any type of agreement with in the note space, you're, available to draft for people correct that oh yeah yeah i help people with, i help people with all those things absolutely yeah so so for people who are interested um in you know brian's services uh brian what's the best way for them to reach out to you sure give me uh give me uh an email or a uh, a phone call phone is 410-268-6600 um or shoot me an email um uh Gallagher, G-A-L-L-A-G-H-E-R at councilbaradel.com. That's C-O-U-N-C-I-L-B-A-R-A-D-E-L.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm in all the different note investing groups. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can look me up um, or uh, just Google search me on the internet. Mm -hmm. Our firm has a website. You'll see me yeah. there. And one of the things also that I 
you know, in, you know, a respect as well that gives, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with attorneys, um, you know, it's like dealing with, and no, it's not, no knock on attorneys. Um, it's like, like dealing with architects. They've, if they've never been in the real world, they can design the prettiest building or the greatest agreement, you know, an attorney can draft the greatest agreement in the world, but it's really not viable. And, you know, one of the things with Brian is Brian is also a real estate investor. So just for people out there, you know, so he's got, you know, um, you know, he invests as well. So it's not just, um, you know, so he sees both sides of it. Um, probably wouldn't want to be on, you know, a dispute on his other side, uh, trying to defend it. But, uh, you know, so from that, you know, he has real firsthand experience um, in, in that. So I think that plays a long ways where, uh, you know, the agreements when I've always had the conversations with you is, you know, this needs to be fair, you know, it needs to protect your interests, but it needs to be fair to both sides of the parties. It can't just be one, one sided agreement because at the end of the day, if it's contested, you might get shredded. So that's one of the other reasons why, you know, I enjoy working with you is because it also, you know, relays down to the people who you know work uh, with me that they have that understanding that yes, this is fair when they've had their attorneys review it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, Brian, thanks for joining us today. Any final thoughts before you go run, take care of uh, um, all the all the little ones? Uh, final thoughts. Um, you know, this is, uh, I looked up the quote, actually, um, and it was Plato who said it uh, in like 500 BC. It's, these are strange times in which we live. Um, and I don't think there's any truer quote uh, than uh, it is right now. These are very strange times in which we live. Um, you know, uh, especially in the note investing world. Um, you know, I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity uh, for note investors uh, in the coming years based on what's happening now. Um, and uh, I will say that, and Chris and I talk about this all the time, I think the most successful people um, ascribe to the maxim of uh, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. You don't have to make every single dollar on every single deal. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of considerations that have to be given um, moving forward, um, coming out of this time. And just, you know, give it some thought. And uh, I think everybody will be okay. Yeah. So, you know, you, you know, from that, I agree a hundred percent and, you know, you got to put yourself, you know, I would just put myself in someone else's shoes um, as well and try and work uh, with people as much as possible on this because this is going to be trying times. So kind of, you know, need to help, you know, my philosophy has always been, I try and help the people who want to be helped. Um, because reality is there's a lot of people out there who want to be helped and I try and work with them and help them. And at the end of the day, I think it has a positive um, social impact to it as well um, as I think from a business perspective, it can also be more beneficial. Uh, you will always have these borrowers who um, don't want to be helped. Uh, and unfortunately, there's not much you can do uh, in those instances. But, you know, you got to try. And if you can't, yeah. then you can't. So, well, thank you today. Thank you again, Brian, for joining us Absolutely. in this episode. And everybody, take care.